So this session holds immense importance um, because it delves into an, an, a deep understanding of the social, economic, and environmental dimensions of research, resource extraction. These debates also play a crucial role in not only facilitating knowledge exchange, but also um, assisting us in our understanding of the challenges posed by extractive industries and communities and society generally. So this also provides us an opportunity to explore the intricate web of the social and environmental injustices that exist in all its dimensions and also the power, power relations uh, between different social actors and how they work together to actually shape uh, research, resource extraction practices and outcomes. So this session will look at uh, you know, some of these issues and against the, the neoliberal logic that has you know, pushed through resource extraction and I can say across the globe and also violently in many cases. So I'll be your session chair today. Uh, my name is Llewellyn Leonard. I'm from UNISA School of Ecological and Human Sustainability, also chair of the Center of Excellence on Adaptation and Resilience. Uh, also joining us today on the panel is uh, Martin Magidi, who's a postdoctoral researcher in the African Center for Cities at the University of Cape Town. We've also got Dr. Luis Adouza, if I pronounced that correctly. Right, okay who is a human geographer with a background in anthropology and critical development studies. He is also a lecturer based at the Department of International Development, King's College London. We also have Jessica Hope, who is a lecturer in sustainable development, uh, School of Geography and Social Development, University of St. Andrews. Um, I think, can I get the uh, speakers to join us in front? You want to sit there? Okay. Yeah, if you feel, feel free to come. Yeah. Great, so we've decided we'll go in order and because I'm chairing, I'll just go first, if that's okay. So today I'm gonna to talk about uh, this presentation which uh, explores the relationship between climate change, mining development, and for water security in the Sumkele community and how this places rural communities in the position of binary risk uh, for mining development and climate change um, with mining also, as you know, contributing to climate change. So, so this, uh, these results are part of a larger project on mining which I looked at in terms of ecological resistance and um, uh, uh, governance of mining, but here I want to focus on this combination of um, mining development, climate change, and water security because uh, these sort of debates are the synergies lacking in the academic space, so I thought it would be good to actually look at this and. Uh, zoom in at a, at a more micro level. Uh, you know, not, lots of the resistance is about the proposed mining operations, um, you know, and the legalities around this. So I thought it would be actually good not to forget the challenges that communities face in terms of resource extraction at the local level, you know, and, and what's, you know, and, and how's that unfolding? So, I wonder if you can see that, but as you know, you know, climate change is expected to make water security and for food and agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa and across the continent more difficult, you know, as weather patterns become, become un, un, uh, less, less, less favorable. And for Africa, we find that agriculture, which is mainly rain-fed, is the principal source of subsistence for rural communities. And there's many cases you know, within Southern Africa across of uh, regions affected by prolonged drought and with uh, temperatures exceeding previous averages. So throwing mining into the equation, you know, uh, coal mining especially, is needed to extract, uh, wash, and process coal. And more than half of the world's largest coal-consuming countries face high to extremely high levels of water stress. And the last time I checked for South Africa, we were number seven uh, with a very high water stress level. And these are attributed to competing demands for water. Uh, for South Africa, the country is on the verge of experiencing a 17% gap in water supply and demand by 2030 and mining results in significant impacts um, you know, on these fresh water resources. As you know, with mining, even um, after operations are complete, years, years, and you know, mining can affect uh, waterways through uh, leaching of toxic metals, et cetera, into waterways. So uh, this actually prevents, it makes it very difficult to, for wildlife and vegetation to reoccur in the area. So as mentioned, uh, this presentation looks um, mostly at the Somkele rural community, although I do pull data from Fulani as well to inform this work. Uh, so in the face of severe climate crisis impacting on water security in the region, the impacts that mining will have and continue to have um, is, is, is actually a concern. 
Uh, so climate change pro 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 projections indicate that rain-fed agriculture in this region will be affected, and there's, there's various reasons for, for example, low annual rainfall, rising temperatures, hydrological risks, uh, increased rainfall um, uh, variability. So this limits water supply and moisture in the soil as well. Uh, just about the case studies, while well, Sumkele has existing mining operations, the Tendela coal mine operating since 2007, uh, Fuleni, about 20 kilometers away, uh, has uh, been targeted for uh, mining operations previously by the Ubuntu coal mine, despite climate change impacting water reserves in the region. Recently, we also had residents who stand to be evicted from the ancestral homes to make way for Tandela's three proposed new mining pits claim that Tandela has been acting unlawfully and appear to be breaching promises to hold up any uh, mining or, re or related activities pending a court case. Uh, which we heard yesterday from um, um, that uh, this should be finalized in mid-July. In mid so the mining company has been also been acting unlawfully in terms of uh, just last month, about five, just over five weeks ago, they were plowing through the grounds uh, in the region. And also the excavator was also operating in a water course, and none of these were authorized in terms of the environmental impact assessments. So that's a concern. So those of you who are not familiar, this is the location of Sumkele community. That is my, yeah, right there. And you can see in terms of uh, the area, which is you know, encircled, the Umfluzi Park, which is encircled by coal mines, which is, which is proposed as well as current uh, mines. And here we can see the Zuland Anthracite Colliery, which is previously owned by Rio Tinto, now the Minar Group owned by Turkish-born mechanical engineer Vuslat Beyoglu, if I got it right. Uh, there's also the Tendela site here, which I just mentioned. We've also got recently a company known as Umvokuzana Resources was granted environmental authorization right here in Fuleni to sink 55 coal prospecting boreholes in the area. And the company has, has three directors, one of which is uh, Vuslat, but also the chair of the Ingomiana Trust. And uh, we've also got RW Mining here, which is the physician um, Dr. Rodney Mokoko and his, and, and his wife, and they have no prior mining experience. So, so, so it's quite surprising that, um, you know, it, it says that it, it's BE deal, so they're acting as uh, a, a front for a major corporation. And, fi and finally, there's also the um, Yango Resources right here, established in 2017 under the directorship of Benedict Botelezzi, who was a Johannesburg-based advocate and also provided legal services to, to this uh, previous corrupt president, Jacob Zuma. So just quickly, the mines, as I said, surround the Influency Park, Africa's oldest formal park and a haven for white rhino, home to the Big Five, rich history and cultural heritage. Uh, Previously, also a hunting ground for the royal family, as, uh, as, as well as King Shaka Zulu. So it's a major tourist attraction. So, so both the Sumkele and rural residents have been opposing mining development, as I said, due to uh, social and environmental impacts. Um, and even the previous Fuleni Environmental Impact Assessment Report in 2015 noted that mining would be devastating in terms of loss of, lo loss of aquatic life, uh, pollution, etc. I'm trying to move quickly here. I'm just going to skip this about climate change and water and, and water security in KZN. As I mentioned, there's a declining water uh, presence in the province over the years, an indicator of the worsening water situation. Um, I'm going to skip this interplay between mining, um, climate change, and water security. There's global cases of civil society resistance against this. Uh, mining authorization and poor governance. Uh, this, I mean, just to say that there's lots of corruption within uh, the mining sector. Uh, we look at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development regarding the anti-bribery convention in South Africa. Uh, they noted that corruption remains a serious problem in the country and mining has been identified as one of the high risk sectors. And we've seen previous raids of the DMR offices by the Hawks. Um, so um, there's lots, lots of evidence of this. So basically the methodology in terms of this, I used a, a, a mixed method approach, uh, conducted questionnaires, um, with the Sumkela residents uh, in terms of household views on impacts of climate variability, mining impacts on livelihoods, water resources, coping strategies, et cetera, for food security. 
Um, and uh, the questionnaire was divided into several sections, about just under 50 questions. Uh, field, field workers from the community uh, were trained and assisted in terms of the distribution. With a population of 4,000 people, uh, had to get uh, a sample of 351 uh, to, make the, to make it a valid representation. Uh, and I ended up collecting 424 questionnaires. Also did interviews with the Fulani residents uh, and some Keller uh, youth as well, as well as external um, civil society supporting uh, the Fulani community. And um, yeah, just here is that I was unable to get access to some of the key informants, um, which I won't have time to go through, but some government officials from REMDEC, um, uh, as well as a local traditional leader from Sakela who agreed to be interviewed, but uh, didn't pitch up for the interview at the last minute. Just quickly, the results. Firstly, I think the demographics are quite important to highlight is that most residents in, in Samkele were between the ages of 31 to 40, followed by 22, 20 to 30. So a fairly young population with just under half of the population being 40 years of age and younger. And more than half of the residents did not have formal employment. Just over half of the residents, as you can see, earned between 2,500 per month to, uh, and, and fewer, earned between 2,000 to 2,500 per month and less earned less than earned 1,000 rands. So, so residents needed to secure alternative livelihood strategies such as farming for food, and you see a large proportion here, 45% engage in farming activities to eat, and followed by 22% to eat and sell. This is just uh, confirming the scientific findings of worsening drought conditions here. Just over half of residents indicated that drought had conditions had worsened, especially since 2015. You can see here, uh, uh, noted by the progression of concern. Uh, due to the severity of drought and mining extraction of water, residents in Sumkela needed to secure water from different locations. And you, you can see one of the main sources was collection of water from the Umfalozi River, 21%, and water harvesting, 17.8%, and a large percentage obtained water from other sources, which is 41.2%, which is from local dams, boreholes, uh, the neighborhood taps, and obtaining water from work, etc. Uh, this is just majority of residents indicated that water need to, needed to be collected every day. You can see 71.5% to for agriculture, and um, then followed by every second and third day. So just on a, um, over half of female residents, which is 51% and 35% of children, were responsible for water collection, and just a minority of men, uh, which was 7%. So lots of the burden placed on women and children to actually collect water. So just uh, some, some interesting quotes. One of the quotes from a female resident explaining the hardships faced by women and, well, and, and children to collect water, having to walk many hours, in fact, some days up to six hours just to go and fetch water and back again, uh, and, and digging water from the riverbed or from the local getting water from the dam. And, and the water delivered by local government was not enough for the entire community of 4,000 people, indicating poor governance and service delivery and poor realization of the constitution rights to water uh, access for people. Uh, here, just a, a few informants highlighted that introducing mining to the area was a concern as water resources was already limited due to climate change and mining development did not take into account the sustainable life, lifestyle of communities and access to local resources and water security was an issue. So why even consider mining uh, and, and grant a prospecting license, etc. Uh, this is just um, the impacts of the Tandela mine was, uh, you know, um, dra draining water from the mine. Uh, sorry, from uh, the Omphalos River was felt beyond Samkela. So although it was there, but uh, even Fulani residents felt it and said, you know, we'd use the same river. So indicating that, you know, uh, this is wide-scale impacts. It's not confined to, you know, a, a, a localized situation. So this slide just emphasizing lack of reliability of sufficient water supply by government and uh, to residents unable to fulfill constitutional rights and mandates to, regarding the right to access to sufficient water by people. Even the Tendela mine, which initially when it started to operate, promised people that it would supply water has failed to do so. So this all has resulted in further tensions and community mining conflicts and we see um, you know, residents being sprayed by, you know, shot by rubber bullets, et cetera. Uh, so, strong element of corruption here, uh, just to show that uh, there's corruption between the traditional council supporting mining, mining development, lack of consultation with residents over land use, including intimidation by traditional leaders towards residents trying to even, you know, even preventing residents from holding meetings and, and being
beating. So I, I think just from an academic point for, so for political ecology, civil society, although in tension with the state and the mining uh, institutions may also be, be constricted and you know, uh, in tension with themselves. Um, so uh, that's something to actually consider. Um, just want to move very quickly in terms of this. Uh, just finally, this um, ways to improve water security. Uh, interesting, major threats to water supply noted by residents was drought, you know, followed by a lack of provision by government and then mining pollution. So people journey noted that it was government who approved the mines in the first place, but it was, they also looked to government as a service provider and the ones who needed to ensure provision of access to water as per the chapter two of the constitution. Uh, so this correlated with findings on recommendations to improve water and almost 60% of residents strongly supported intervention by government followed by the need to, for water tanks and provision by uh, water by the mining company. So just to conclude, uh, you know, that the impacts of mining on water resources, you know, you can see exacerbated uh, climatic conditions here. Uh, the findings do, do illustrate that eco ecological harms and resistance to mining is, is intrinsic to capitalism with corruption of, in, in mining, intimidation of those who stand up to defend their lands, water, and hold leaders accountable. Um, yeah, just some slides about um, you know, what, what probably needs to be done in terms of spatial development planning and uh, taking a more holistic approach, uh, holistic approach to planning to integrate uh, in, in terms of uh, you know, taking into account agriculture, uh, conservation, and tourism. Um, and the need for formal legal protection of strategic water sources in the area, it's just 1% of uh, st strategic water sources which are protected, so it's free for all, which is concerned. And I think I'm gonna leave it there, because there's much to say. Uh, my time is now up. <laughs> so I'm gonna hand over to the next speaker. Um, if it's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do the presentations first, and then we can engage in, um, in questions and discussion after that. So I'm gonna call the next. Um, there's no particular order. Um, Martin, I think you're up next. Yeah, great. Hi, right, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Martin Magidi. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow in the African Center for Cities at um, the University of Cape Town. Um, I will be presenting a research that I did um, almost 10 years ago as part of my master's. I, I, I just did my master's. I, throw it aside, then I concentrated on my PhD, and only last year, but one, that's when I discovered that I think it's something that I can really pursue. Otherwise, I am working in a completely different uh, space now. I work in cities, urban governance, and this is something that I just did for my master's, but, okay. So, um, bank railing the, store, the state and milking local communities, uh, mining and the trade means of production at uh, Konmara Mine in Zimbabwe. In, so just for background case, uh, Zimbabwe has a very rich um, mining history and mining economy as well, uh, dating back from um, the pre-colonial era with a lot of minerals, at least six of them, including diamonds, gold, lithium. In, I think Zimbabwe comes second to South Africa in terms of mineral resources in, in, in Africa. Uh, the sector also ranges from very small, at, at is now, and illegal miners to medium scale, uh, as well as large scale miners. Uh, so because mining requires a lot of uh, capital, as we may all know, not many local uh, investors can afford to run like large mining operations in Zimbabwe. So local Zimbabweans are restricted to artisanal and small uh, mining operations. Then the medium to large scale mining is normally uh, the multinational companies. Of course, some of them working hand in hand with uh, local uh, investors. So um, um, just to name a few of them, we have uh, South African Zimplas, we have uh, Anglo-American companies like Rio Tindo, also has Chinese, Chinese uh, mining companies like Anchin, like we have so many of them here. And uh, mining in Zimbabwe is regulated uh, by the government through the responsible ministries, Minister of Mining and the Minister of Environment. And there are also government bodies which work in hand with, uh, with, with, with those minerals, like the Environmental Management Body, the Zimbabwe Mining Development, uh, uh, then the Mineral Marketing Mine and the Arabies that which regulates uh, uh, the gold sector. And then 
Of course, some of the laws include the Environmental Management Act of 2002, the Atmospheric Pollution Prevention, the Hazardous Substance, just to mention a few. Then, um, yeah, as part of my background as well, like um, where mining operations grow like, and expand, they normally uh, then tend to urban centers, and we have quite a number of them in Zimbabwe, Kwe, Kwe, Kweru, I mean, many, many mining operations that actually then graduated sort of into, into, into mining centers. And um, a lot of employment as well is created in mining. For example, one of the largest uh, asbestos mines used to employ at least 5,000 permanent workers. Then many others employed in, um, in upstream and downstream firms. And, then, um, of course, I mentioned the artisanal mining who are sort of like self-employed. And uh, the contribution to the uh, GDP is around 17%, uh, and it also generates up to 60% of uh, the foreign currency in Zimbabwe. Then, um, well, according to literature, this is what is known about uh, mining the negative uh, impacts of mining, issues around environmental degradation, pollution of all kinds. Uh, there's also issues around uh, corruption and money laundering. For those of us who are from Zimbabwe or maybe South Africa, you may be aware of uh, a recent document that, that was released by Al Jazeera investigative unit, uh, which is called the, 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 the Gold Mafia, which documents how like, gold was being looted from Zimbabwe. To Dubai. Uh, then, yeah, there are issues around power uh, and human rights abuses as well by powerful elites in, uh, in, 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 in government and in, in, ruling, in the ruling party. Uh, for example, we have uh, illegal miners in the part of the mine, in, in the part of the country where the mine that I concentrated on like, is located, where politicians deploy illegal miners uh, in return for like favors when it comes to, 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 to elections. Those illegal mining games are, are then deployed as a militia to, 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 to unleash violence against the opposition parties. I think I'll jump some of these for the sake of... Then I'll move on to my theoretical framing. I, 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 I did what I thought was a bit innovative for a master's student, then, then I brought together the treadmills of production and the resource case uh, theory. And I was like, I don't want to analyze the context of uh, mining in, at Konmara or in Zimbabwe in the context of like, so I was like, I just want to bring those two together. Then I come up with sort of like a framework or a combined theory which brings uh, components of the two together. So for those of you who know that the trademark of, uh, of production is basically, it, it, it explores, the, ex explores the relationship between um, capital and the, and, and the environment, e how an economic system interferes with uh, the organization of the ecology. Then on the other hand, there is the resource case, which basically say um, natural resource rich, um, whether countries or communities, they normally don't benefit a lot from their, their resources. But, I mean, other people from somewhere come in, take their resources, accumulate wealth, then they leave chaos on the ground. So um, one thing that I liked about uh, these two theories is, is they mention um, the major actors in mining, uh, which is uh, the state, uh, the investors, and uh, labor as well. And uh, interesting enough, a, we can already observe that um, nothing is being said about the local communities, like the host communities. Like, in as much as they are the ones who own, in brackets, in, 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 in quotes to say, and who also host the, 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 the natural resources, they are, they are rarely mentioned in, 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 in these discussions. And so that's why I, come up with, um, I came up with uh, this 
theory which I then uh, converted into a conceptual framework of some sort. So what we see here is uh, a, how can I put it together? All right, so I brought together the, 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 the miners, the, the state, and the labor. Uh, it's sort of like, so it's not highlighting, okay. But I mean the uncolored or the plain uh, uh, shapes or the plain circles, they just show, I would say that's, that's my representation, the grammatic representation of the trade news of production. Then um, the blue ones, uh, that's my addition from the resource case. And together, what I then concluded was uh, uh, there is local community poverty at the end of mining or after mining, after combining uh, what this theory is actually saying. So this is what I came up with. Then about Konmara mine is, is a rural mine located in the Midlands of Zim uh, state, uh, province in Zimbabwe, located almost centrally between Zimbabwe's fifth largest city and sixth largest city. So that's like 30 kilometers to the other and 34 kilometers to the other side. And it was owned by two Canadian mines, I mean owners, uh, Quantum Minerals owning 95% and the Chess Minerals owning 5%, no local uh, ownership in this, uh, in this mining range. Then um, it was one of the largest gold producers in Zimbabwe, like at the time when it was about to close, that's the statistics that I managed to get. To get. It uh, generated, um, it produced over 900 kilograms, but it's being said that it was already on their, on their, on, 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 I mean, production was already declining. Then, okay. then I move on to the methods. It was basically qualitative ethnographic methods. I talked to local residents and um, officials as well from our stakeholder and interested organizations. Then my findings. Yeah, what would I, what I would regard as uh, like the positive findings was like there was construction of like a primary school. Uh, there was also a clinic. They, were, they also say electricity was also like drawn near to the communities and employment of some sort. But what actually then turned out to be like the major impact of, of mining was uh, uh, what I would say the negative impact of mining which started with uh, displacement as people were moved from their original homes to elsewhere. Then even if there was like employment generated, but it was basically casual labor for the locals, none of them like occupied higher or higher paying positions. Then um, issues around like open peace that were left like open. This mine was actually closed or sort of like abandoned in the early 2000s. Uh, structural damages like houses and other buildings around the area, you could see like a lot of cracks uh, from what they would say damages caused by vibration. There was also like extensive loss of vegetation, uh, reckless disposal of solid and liquid waste as well, uh, contamination, soil contamination, which left uh, like the soils unsuitable for farming, like the, some of them actually can't support any economic activity. Then open pits and trenches which trap livestock. There are sharp metals like thrown all over the, some parts of the mine. There are also metal in stone rubbles and um, abandoned structures as well, over 100 ghost houses that I hit. I'm, I'm, I'm concluding. Then, um, uh, all right, I'll just move on to show some of uh, the pictures that I had. Excuse me, something happened with my pictures. But this is, uh, well, they say it's contaminated soil. It's part of uh, some of the buildings that are actually cracking. Then um, I counted up to 10 these op of these open pits and countless uh, open trenches. Then um, I would say the major takeaways were the residents were saying nothing is being done they like even to rehabilitate this mine because they assumed that there are powerful politicians who are involved in the mine. Some of, some of them were actually angry to take over, so rehabilitating didn't make sense. But there was also some who were saying the artisanal miners who are being deployed in here by powerful politicians. They come here, 
they mine, then they sell cheap gold to the politicians as well. Then um, there is also, there was also the assumption that um, there is a lot of rent seeking happening in, 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 in Zimbabwe, in the mining sector, where officially on the shareholding structure, you don't find someone's name, but behind the scenes, they own the mine. So residents actually suspected that they were powerful politicians who were part of the shareholding structure of, uh, of, the, of that mine, who were just like, no, nothing will happen to us. And um, yeah, I would say that's, that's all for now. Thank you for listening. Uh, well, hello everyone. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll try to be quick in the presentation. Um, so what I'm going to present today uh, it's derived from a research project uh, based originally in the University of St. Andrews and the Institute for Amazonian Studies in the city of Iquitos in the Peruvian Amazon. And originally the project uh, was interested in understanding the social and cultural values associated to what is one of the largest peatland complexes in the Amazon rainforest in the Western Amazon, uh, located in the Peruvian Amazon. And um, nevertheless, as the, uh, with the participatory development of this research agenda, it became uh, evident that uh, it was impossible to understand the kind of transformations in local territorialities, in local relations to the landscape without understanding the way in which uh, the political economy of oil extraction, which has been at the basis of this region uh, since the 1970s, um, has affected and how uh, local communities are relating um, to this, uh, this activity, right, and the extractive complex. So this is the story that I'm going to tell today. Um, uh, the idea also analytically for me is to understand uh, or the understanding of, of extractive complexes not only as producing primary commodities, right, but uh, perhaps more, more critically and more uh, relevantly as producing certain forms of uh, a new social subjects, right? New forms of subjectivity, new forms of uh, state, new forms of citizenship, and in this case also new forms of indigeneity. And this is um, what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so one of the, of, of the concepts here that in the, in the um, the uh, title in the presentation is an even and combined uh, extraction. This I borrowed from um, the scholar Martin Arboleda who uh, um, deployed this concept in order to understand the ways in which extractive complexes, um, especially in settings like this one, combine not only you know, the uh, um, transformations in, in, uh, at the on a predatory scale of capitalist logistics and uh, innovations in high finance, but also the reproduction of, uh, in this case, non-capitalist social formations, for example, and the, and the creation of, um, of new forms uh, of, of political organization that combine and articulate the, this, these different moments under the aegis of capital accumulation. And this is uh, a bit what frames theoretically what I'm going to talk about. So, I'm going to first to lay out the ways in which the development of the political economy of oil extraction in this region grew in tandem with the creation of what one could call an ethno-bureaucratic or ethno-political field uh, that expressed the sort of uneven geography, uh, the distribution of environmental harms and benefits in the region, uh, and this, as I said, is expressed in this kind of ethno-political field. Um, so, the oil extraction in this region dates to the 1970s, where there's a big boom in, in the early 70s in oil prospection in this, in this region, also linked to the, assert, the constitution of territorial power of both the Peruvian and Ecuadorian state in the Western Amazon. Um, the key piece of infrastructure uh, in this moment was the completion in 1977 of the Oleoducto North Peruano, the North Peruvian pipeline, which uh, connects these very remote uh, zones of extraction to the Pacific coast in, the Peru, uh, in Peru across the, the Andes. This remains one of the largest infrastructure projects in the country. And, uh, and th th the development of, of this uh, was linked to a, uh, a period of rapid urbanization, um, 
this do on the one hand to the kind of economic transformations brought about by this um, massive, if, if also very transient, uh, labor market in rural areas in this region, um, and, and and the transformations that this uh, brought about in rural economies, many people uh, ended up moving to the city after this period. And also, also the concentration of uh, the oil rents at the level of the central government and, um, the, uh, and therefore in the capital city of Iquitos. So there was a big uh, urban expansion that is very much linked with, the, with, with this um, extractive cycle, uh, so to speak. And, and the flip side of this, of course, uh, is a uh, um, deeply racialized extractive periphery, right? The creation of, um, uh, well, indigenous territories, which at the time were still yet to be officially recognized by the Peruvian state, became part of this extractive periphery with no consultation and have been since uh, subjected to frequent and compounding ecological disasters, uh, hundreds and hundreds of oil spills, most of them uh, not even registered um, due to the very remote nature of these areas. Uh, just from uh, to th in the past two decades, uh, around 500 oil spills have been officially registered in the region's uh, different concession blocks, but, but many, as I mentioned, haven't even been registered such as the one in the community that we were working with, for example. Um, so, um, what, what's important to understand here is how the very economic conditions of profitability, right, of competitive uh, profitability of the sector, which in this case has to contend with not only very remote um, uh, extraction areas, but also with a lower quality of petroleum and, and, and different factors, um, the, the, the economic conditions of profitability of uh, fossil capital in this region uh, are very deeply intertwined in this way with the political and cultural conditions that sustain the dev devaluation of indigenous territories, right? Um, indigenous health, indigenous life, uh, the, uh, the, the kind of uh, ecological uh, um, disasters that are, have been taking place over the past decades here. Um, you know, this is a very fairly straightforward form of racial capitalism where the, the conditions of profitability of extractive capital depend in very direct ways on, on this kind of racialized subordination of a certain uh, sector of the population, right? Um, and this is, therefore, has also been linked uh, very, very closely with the emergence of new indigenous movements, precisely very much tied to this common experience of environmental disaster. Uh, this is a region where there are tens of different languages spoken, and nevertheless, one of the things that have brought many of uh, the different indigenous identities together in, in new fe federations have been precisely the way uh, in which uh, these indigenous territories have tried to negotiate their position in these new uh, conditions since the 70s, right? So, um, the development of oil of the oil industry proceeded in this way in tandem with the process of land titling uh, and the development, as I mentioned, of ethnic federations. Right? Um, in this way, indigeneity became a crucial modality of political uh, subjectivity and the federation its main organizational form. Uh, and this is a kind of an ambivalent process through which both the social tensions inherent in what I, uh, what I explained was the, the kind of geography of the Amazonian oil complex are politically managed and, uh, the, the, and contained uh, in this kind of what ant some anthropologists have called this ethno-bureaucratic field of neoliberal multiculturalism as a way of um, integrating kind of uh, indigenous populations into the national state. And at the same time, it, uh, it lays out a new grounds for the articulations of demands and, and new modalities of agency um, by communities affected by, by oil extraction in ways that continually threatened uh, to disrupt extractive circuits. So you have a very contradictory um, kind of political form of extraction in this, in this sense. Um, so, in the last few minutes that I have, uh, I'll um, illustrate this in the, in, uh, with the case of an Uralina community, in, uh, Nuevo Unión, the, the community that we were working with, um, and, uh, and to show the ways in which um, communities, ha ha uh, the different strategies that communities have 
taken in order to navigate this um, this circumstance. Um, so uh, the new Nueva Unión resettled very recently when we were doing field work here. Uh, the, the community was in uh, just in this process of moving as part of the negotiations with Plus Petrol. Uh, one of the uh, sections of the pipeline of the oleoducto nor peruano cuts across the title lands of the communities. And this uh, movement of the community had, uh, was, uh, had implied deep transformations in all aspects of life there. Um, so the resettlement was done in the context of a period of mobilizations that by the community to demand reparations for an oil spill that had happened a few years ago. Um, and ne nevertheless, the movement expressed a kind of tipping point in, in the sort of spatial and political tensions that had been incubating for a longer period, over a, a bit around a decade, uh, and structured around the, the increasing role of money that um, was having in, in the local economy. It's a community that 20 years ago, money was very rarely uh, used, uh, well, definitely not used within the community, but very rarely used with uh, outsiders even. Uh, the, the way in which the community are um, related to um, mestizo traders, for example, was mostly through this kind of deferred credit, uh, direct uh, changing like trade goods for forest resources more directly. And money was having a, a big role there. And as money becomes more important, the the relationships through which money flow into the community, uh, which uh, are main, uh, mainly uh, through the relationship to the state and through the, uh, the relationship to the oil company, starts becoming, uh, started becoming more and more important. Um, so one of the effects of the community moving uh, to this new site uh, this new site, uh, the ecological conditions in this new site is, are very different. Uh, it's a flooding forest, so um, almost six months out of the year, the, the territory is underwater. This means that they lo lose direct access to what were their cultivation areas for the food gardens, or chakras, uh, as people call them there, um, which in turn uh, yeah, uh, meant a greater reliance on monetary income and therefore a greater, uh, a greater importance of these political relations and uh, the engagement of the community in the kind of ethno-political ethno field that I described before. Um, uh, this changes uh, all, all kinds of aspects in the community life. One is, for example, the important changes in the political structure. The positions of uh, representation, for example, political representations linked to the process of land titling uh, over the past decades, uh, have always had a kind of uneasy relationship to the more vernacular forms of political um, of politics among the Urarina and other uh, Amazonian peoples in, in Peru. Nevertheless, as um, money becomes more important and therefore the relationship to, to the oil film and to the state become more important, these positions of representation become also much more important. In, in, and in the case of this community, as they lose their access to uh, cultivation lands, become materially consequential in ways that there were, weren't before the resettlement. So uh, these positions of representation become much more important, changing the compl uh, completely the political structure of the community uh, until then. And also there's a very gender nature to this. Uh, relations to outsiders are normally um, very much uh, a male-dominated sphere. Most of uh, women are monolingual. They only speak Urarina. Uh, Spanish is normally uh, a, a language that a man, men, men are competent at. And um, this, uh, this also um, changes the, the place that women play in social reproduction itself, right? So if, for example, social reproduction was much more uh, rooted in tending to the food garden before, where women and children have a more active role, now that it depends on political negotiation, there's an important gender dimension to these changes as well. Um, so just to conclude um, in, uh, in the last few minutes, um, it's important to understand that this process of change that we see uh, is not really a kind of linear story in which a, a non-commodified form of social reproduction becomes integrated into the circuits of global capitalism. Uh, 
rather, uh, looking at the broader history of the community, you can see a much more oscillatory movement uh, that speaks in my mind to a kind of more structural bind that uh, uh, indigenous Amazonian societies f uh, face in their relationship to national societies in, in this region. Uh, the, the community, the, the old settlement, was actually founded as a way to escape from previous cycles of, of uh, extractivism that had taken place in the region, in particular uh, um, there was, the way in which it worked in the mid 20th century was through uh, forms of dead peonage in, all, in order to extract valuable timber in this basin in particular, in the Chambira Basin. And uh, the old settlement, uh, the old people uh, um, tell us, w was founded as a way to move away from that and escape this kind of dead trap through which uh, extractivism uh, used to operate in this region. Um, and now you, ha you find the, the kind of opposite movement in which uh, the community in many ways, or at least certain uh, uh, portions of the community, um, choose to engage in this kind of antagonistic dependence uh, and, and engage in this ethno-political field as a way of relating uh, and funding a place or negotiating a place in the political economy of, uh, of extraction in the region. So what you have is, uh, I think, uh, really uh, uh, the community oscillating between these two poles. On the one hand, one pole that uh, pri privileges uh, autonomy, uh, but also uh, entails a lot of marginalization and another poll which uh, entails a racialized subordinate, subordination into the political economy of extraction, but that affords certain forms of agency that are not uh, available in, in the other uh, kind of strategy. And I think that this speaks to a broader, like I said, uh, question of the ways, in the, the options available for many Amazonian peoples in, relation, in relating to the national state. The most extreme example of which, for example, could be what, what's often known as the uh, uh, people in voluntary isolation being one extreme case of people uh, privileging like autonomy, in, but, but with a big cost in terms of marginalization and, and isolation, right? And on the other, the, the, this kind of engagement uh, with, with the extractive economies in with, uh, through which the Amazonian region is integrated into uh, national societies in this region. So I'll leave it there, and thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, before I start, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's organized this conference, because it is so good to be here, uh, and so exciting to be in South Africa and to have traveled to this meeting. Uh, so I'm going to talk today, I'm glad I followed Luis because it's the same region um, and a similar politics, um, think, but a turn to thinking about infrastructure and particularly road infrastructure. I just wanted to start because it seems like a lot of work here at the conference has been very, and a lot of the panels have been very geographically focused. So I just wanted to say that I have done all my research today in Bolivia. And I just wanted to say specifically, you know, Bolivia is an amazing place to visit, but also an amazing place, an important place, negotiating trajectories of sustainability. Um, partly because uh, it has a post-neoliberal state, which has turned out to be an extractive-led state, that is, uh, has renegotiated with global oil corporations to renationalize, sort of, um, the gas industry um, and to create new forms of welfare, but very conflictive, massive new frontiers for extraction in the country. At the same time, there are very, very fertile decolonizing agendas, um, indigenous-led. For example, the country is now plurinational by constitutionally recognizing different indigenous nations. It now incorporates indigenous concepts around Vivier Bien and good life um, into national development plans overlapping, contested with extraction, but nonetheless happening. Um, and at the same time, is taken up the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So these kind of three overlapping but distinctive um, strands kind of ground this project and also uh, my interest in Bolivia. However, we are going to go more...